Let's pray. Our great God and Heavenly Father, as we approach your throne this morning together as a body, as a congregation, God, we give you praise, we give you honor, we give you glory. We magnify and extol your blessed and your holy, holy, holy name today. We thank you for this privilege that we have to spend this time gathered together in your name to examine your word that we might worship you in spirit and in truth today. God, our prayer is simply this, that you would convict the lost. Dear God, that you would regenerate the, those that are dead in their sins. Dear God, that you would make them alive, cause them to understand and to know the great reality of our standing before you in our sin, hopeless and helpless. And at the same time, God, in that regeneration, remind it us, dear God, today. Remind those of us who are saved, dear God, as your word would not uh, do initially that work of regeneration, but that your work would do a work of revival in our hearts and in our minds, that we would be reminded that we have a great hope today. And our hope is that of eternal life, bought and paid for by your precious blood, which you shed on the cross at Calvary. And the fact that you rose again on the third day gives us an everlasting and an eternal hope. So God, I pray that you would show us Christ in the scriptures this morning. Save the lost. Revive the downcast. Give hope to those who are losing heart. Give strength to those who are faint. May the joy of the Lord be our strength this very day. For it is in Jesus' name I pray. Amen. Amen. In the last week, if you'll recall, in the first eight verses of this chapter, uh, we see how God providentially, uh, ahead of time, made a promise to his people to protect them uh, down the road, which would be according to the text of Zechariah there, which would have been likely two to three hundred years down the road. But God looked out for his saints then, and I want you to be assured today, church, that God looks out for his saints today. We are kept by the grace of Almighty God. So as we enter into this text today, verses 9 through 12, we, we are going to look at, if you want to put the header on your notes, we see the promise of the blessed and the only potentate. We have this terminology used in the New Testament epistle. Uh, the Apostle Paul refers to Christ as, or I'm sorry, Peter, as the blessed and the only potentate. Potentate. In other words, he is the high king. They sing in that song, high king of heaven. Jesus is the, as the scripture tells us, the capital K, king of all the lowercase kings. Amen. He, There is none higher than our Lord Jesus Christ. But as we enter into the text, let's begin to look at this as we resume our place here in Zechariah's ninth chapter. Again, we're picking up in verse 9, going through verse 12 today, when we read the promise, the Lord's promise specifically to send the Messiah to save his people. Now, how good is it to receive glad tidings in the present? We've all heard the term, I've got good news and I've got bad news. We like to play tough and say, well, give me the bad news first. When the reality of it is, we always want to hear the good news. The scripture says this in Proverbs chapter 25, verse 25. Like cold water to a thirsty soul, so is good news from a far country. The people here in the text, again, as we have mentioned throughout, going throughout this series, uh, in Haggai and Zechariah and Ezra, uh, the people are not unlike us in that they were real people. They had real problems, they had real issues, they had real concerns, and they needed a very real and a very present help in their time of trouble. And God, as the psalmist declared, is a very present help in time of trouble. So once again, here in the text, what we find is the faithfulness of God ringing out loud and clear. The first statement made here by Zechariah concerning the word of the Lord in verse 9 is as though 
it were a lighthouse, if you would have it as though it were a lighthouse shining in the darkness of the night. To the wayfaring pilgrim, this light shines as a beacon of hope. One of the old spiritual songs says this, I'm just a poor wayfaring stranger traveling through this world below. There is no sickness, no toil, no danger in that bright land to which I go. The song goes on to say, I know dark clouds will gather around me. I know my way is hard and steep, but beauteous fields arise before me where God's redeemed their vigils keep. Here in the midst of all that is going on, in the midst of the rebuilding of the tabernacle, in the fourth year of King Darius is where we are. So they've likely been, they are back in Jerusalem for around 22 or so years. Here they are after eight, eight, an 18 year hiatus. Remember the Lord comes, sends the word of God by the prophet Haggai follows up with the words of the prophet Zechariah. And here in the midst of this, the Lord continues to encourage and to strengthen his people. And what are the first words of verse 9? Rejoice. Rejoice. And notice here, not just rejoice, but the text, the Lord declares to his people in the text to rejoice greatly. It's the term that is used here by the Lord. And immediately following in the text is the reason for rejoicing given by God to His people. We are not called to laugh like idiots at everything. Amen? We are called to have a reason for rejoicing. And the reason of our rejoicing is the hope of Jesus Christ. The Apostle Peter said, Be ready always to give every man an answer, an apologia of the hope, of the reason for the hope that you have within you. So notice the text says, Rejoice greatly. And then the text says, Behold. As if to say, Looky here, looky here. Behold, your king is coming to you. Now, there is no doubt that in this passage, this refers to the first advent of our Lord. That term advent means the first coming of our Lord. And since the day of the fall in the Garden of Eden, the Lord has promised His Messiah would come. In the book of Genesis, chapter 3, 15, in theological terminology, this phrase is called the Proto-Evangelium which means the first proclamation or the first good news. We have this in the book of Genesis chapter 3. After Adam and Eve, even Adam sinned, the Lord calls them on the carpet, so to speak, calls them before him, and he is addressing their sin. And he says, Adam, because you have sinned, you will work by the sweat of your brow. He says to Eve, Eve, because you have sinned, you will have pain in childbirth. And then to the serpent, these are the words of the Lord in Genesis chapter 3, 15. The Lord says this, I will put enmity between you and the woman. And between your offspring and her offspring, he shall bruise your head and you shall bruise his heel. This was not a general reference to humanity in general. This was a reference to... To the Lord Jesus Christ. Rejoice as we sang in that song. Rejoice, rejoice, O Christian. Lift up your voice and sing. Eternal hallelujahs to Jesus Christ the King. The hope of all who seek Him. The help of all who find. None other is so loving, so good and kind. We have reason to rejoice. And the church in the wilderness in the text today has a reason to rejoice because they were having not only the provision and the providence of God protecting them throughout time and history as we still do today, but they had the promise 
of the blessed and the only potentate, the King of kings and the Lord of lords who was to come. Again, the text says, Behold, your king is coming to you. This terminology of a king was not unfamiliar. Rather, it was very familiar to the children of Israel. Just as it was familiar to the people of all the lands. Why? A king represents his people. A king represents his country. And all these years of history, all this time as the children of Israel have been a part of history, all these years, all these earthly kings that they had encountered, some good and some evil, these kings would be but just a dim shadow compared to the majesty of the Lord of glory who was to come. Amen. John Calvin said, And we have also seen elsewhere that when the prophets speak of the safety of the church, they mention a king. Because the Lord designed to gather again the dispersed church under one head, even Christ. Who is the head of the church now? Christ. Christ. Who was the head of the church then, as in our text? Christ. Christ. He has been and ever shall be the head of his church. Notice here. Notice in the text as we follow along. Behold, your king is coming to you. And it says this, righteous. Righteous and having salvation is he. Humble and mounted on a donkey, the fo on a colt, the foal of a donkey. So this matter of how Christ would come, how the king would come, would prove to be a challenge, as we see in the New Testament. And as we see today, this matter of how the Christ would come would be the challenge for some to receive. Why? Because the expectation of kings is not what the Bible, of the people, is not what the Bible set out. All the great kings of the earth, they come with pomp and they come with circumstance. The kings of the earth, they flaunt their wealth and they flaunt their power with shows of pageantry. Oh, but our Lord, He came in obscurity. Our Lord came to the sounds of livestock in the squalor of a stable. The kings of the earth, they ride on majestic stallions. But our Lord, our Lord, as prophesied here and as we'll see in Matthew here in just a minute, our Lord came riding on a donkey for the time that was proclaimed by the mouth of the prophet Zechariah here. From this time, it would be somewhere around 530 or so years after that our Savior would ride into Jerusalem. And he would ride into Jerusalem with the shouts of the crowd who cried, Hosanna! Who cried, Blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord. These, is what, these are the cries that Christ came into Jerusalem on. But it is as likely that many who made these same declarations of Hosanna... Blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord. Many of these same folks would later holler, crucify him, crucify him, just a short time after this took place. So if you turn to Matthew chapter 21, very quickly, Matthew chapter 21, we'll notice it in the text, notice how the scripture gives specific clarity and specificity that speaks to this prophecy given by Zechariah. Matthew chapter 21, verses 1 through 11. Now when they drew near to Jerusalem and they came to Bethpage, to the Mount of Olives, then Jesus sent two disciples, saying to them, Go into the village in front of you, and immediately you will find a donkey tied and a colt with her. Untie them and bring them to me. If anyone, if anyone says anything to you, you shall say, The Lord needs them, and he will send them at once. This took place to fulfill what was spoken by the prophet, saying, 
say to the daughter of Zion, Behold, your king is coming to you, humble and mounted on a donkey, on a colt, the foal of a beast of burden. The disciples went and they did just as Jesus had directed them. They brought the donkey and the colt and put on them their cloaks and he sat on them. Most of the crowd spread their cloaks on the road and others cut branches from the trees and spread them on the ground. And the crowds that went before him and that followed him were shouting, Hosanna to the son of David. Blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord. Hosanna in the highest. When he had entered Jerusalem, the whole city was stirred up saying, Who is this? And the crowds said, This is the prophet Jesus from Nazareth of Galilee. So we see 530 or so years later that to the T, this was fulfilled. Very important. That's good for us today to know. They didn't, they couldn't see all this, but they had this promise. So notice going up, going back just a little bit there in in verse nine we want to we want to we do want to talk about the terminology that is used. Behold, your king is coming to you, righteous and having salvation is he. Now the Hebrew terms that are used there for righteous and having salvation that term righteous literally means just. It means to be lawful. There would be a just and a lawful king that would be given to God's people. There ever has been since the creation of the world and shall be until our Lord returns a problem with humanity in power. They will never be fully just. They will never be fully lawful and they will never be Fully righteous. But the promise of Christ our King. The scripture text here tells us that He is just. That He is lawful. And that He is righteous. Christ is just. Christ is righteous. Christ is lawful in His government. Christ is just and right and lawful in His cause. Christ is just, right, and lawful in His conduct and in His character. Christ is righteous as far as so far as the Scripture tells us, righteous as justified and being vindicated by God. In First Timothy chapter three sixteen, the Scripture tells us this. Paul tells Timothy, "Great indeed, we confess, is the mystery of godliness." Why? Because he was manifested in the flesh. Jesus was manifested in the flesh. Jesus was vindicated in the spirit. Jesus was seen by angels. Jesus was proclaimed among the nation. Jesus was uh, believed on in the world. And Jesus was taken up into glory. This king that is being proclaimed here to the children of Israel by the prophet Zechariah is not like the kings of the world or kings of the earth. The next term, notice it says, in having salvation. That Hebrew term literally means endowed with salvation, meaning he is able to save. Amen. He is able to deliver. He is able to do this, as the prophet Isaiah said, to the uttermost. He is able. He is able to save from moral failures in sin for which Christ died are our sins. Every human that has lived, that ever, that does live and ever shall live has a problem with morality. Our problem is that we are sinful. That we are not good. But oh, our King is good. And because He is good and because He is just and because He is righteous, he is able to save those who would come to Him by faith. Amen. 
This in being endowed with salvation, this king, this king being endowed with salvation means that he is able to bring victory where no earthly king can bring victory. Oh, this is Jesus Christ that is being spoken of in the text. Notice again concerning this term just and righteous in Romans chapter 3, verse 21 through 26. Notice what the Apostle Paul says and notice the words that he uses. But now the righteousness of God has been manifested apart from the law. Oh, look. The law was given to demonstrate the righteousness and the holiness of God, yes. But it was also to demonstrate and to manifest that we ever come short of the righteousness of of God. But Paul says the righteousness of God has been manifested apart from the law. How? In the person of Jesus Christ. Amen. He said, although the law and the prophets bear witness to it, the righteousness of God through faith in Jesus Christ to all who believe. How can I be made right in God's sight? Believe on Jesus Christ. How can you be clothed in the righteous robe of redemption? Believe in Jesus Christ. How can you be justified even though we are yet sinners? Through the person of Jesus Christ. Amen. The Apostle Paul goes on here and he says this, There is no distinction for all have sinned and all fall short of the glory of God and are justified by His grace as a gift through through the redemption that is in Christ Jesus, whom God put forward as a propitiation by His blood to be received by faith. Now, again, I know I mentioned that that uh, that, that old uh, there is the, that old song, uh, the lighthouse, right? And in one part of that old song, it says. People say there's no need for that lighthouse standing here around. We, we have grown beyond or, or we're somehow moved far above uh, the truths of the gospel and the need of salvation. But my friend, there is salvation in no other other than the person of the Lord Jesus Christ. Again, continuing on here in Romans, Paul goes on to say this. This was to show God's righteousness. Why? Because in his divine forbearance, he had passed over the former sins, but it was to show his righteousness at the present time so that he might be just, Jesus, he might be just, and that he might not only be just, but that he would be the one who justifies the ungodly, of the one who has faith, in Jesus Christ. This is the king that is being proclaimed to God's people in the days of Zechariah the prophet. Moving forward now in verse 10. Notice verse 10 says, I will cut off the chariot from Ephraim and the war horse from Jerusalem and the battle bow shall be cut off and he shall speak peace to the nations his rule shall be from sea to sea and from the river to the ends of the earth. Who is he talking about doing this? He's referring to the king that he just proclaimed. Who is the king that will make an end of all wars? It is the Lord Jesus Christ. Amen. Who is it that will bring peace to the nations? It is the Lord Jesus Christ. It, who is it that will rule from the river Euphrates as being mentioned there to the ends of the earth? It is the Lord Jesus Christ. So it is in this statement we read that the Lord will cut off the war horses. Throughout history, Israel and its surrounding nations knew nothing but war. And here, notice here, however, we read the promise of God to them that one day, ultimately, there will be a cutting off of all that brings sorrow and sadness. What do we see in this? We see the foreshadowing of the day when God's elect, when God's chosen people, His church, will be free from, the, from fears that are uh, to us many times 
reasonable and rational fears, nonetheless, there will be a day when we will be free from those fears and finally, ultimately, free from the fear of death itself. There will be a day of peace, the Scripture talks of, that will never end. This promise, this promise is particularly encouraging. Imagine an endless day where there will be nothing but eternal praise of our God and of our King. Amen. Richard Baxter has said this concerning heaven. He said, Heaven is a state of perfect holiness and of a continual love and praise to God. And the wicked have no heart to this. The imperfect love and praise and holiness which are here to be attained, they have, the wicked have no mind of, much less of that which is so much greater. The joys of heaven are of so pure and so spiritual a nature that the heart of the wicked can not desire them. The term is lightly thrown around by the world. Oh, this is just like heaven. Folks, outside of what the Word of God teaches us about heaven, there is no knowing of heaven. But my friends, we can be sure of this. That when we are in heaven, it will be heaven because Christ is there. Amen. Verse 11, as we move forward, the blood, notice this terminology in verse 11, particularly the blood of my covenant with you. Verse 11, as for you also, because of the blood of my covenant with you, I will set your prisoners free from the waterless pit. Matthew Henry said the prophet, having taught those that had returned out of captivity to attribute their deliverance to the blood of the covenant and to the promise of the Messiah. For they were so wonderfully helped because that blessing was in them, was yet in the womb of their nation. In other words, it was in their hearts and in their minds, yet they did not yet know or understand the fullness of this reality that was being spoken to them. But Henry goes on, he says, but now comes to encourage them with the prospect of a joyful and a happy settlement and of glorious times before them and such happiness that they did enjoy in a great measure truly in so for some time. But these were promises that had their full accomplishment in the spiritual blessings of the gospel, which church we enjoy today by Jesus Christ. Two types of covenants as we consider this term covenant because it would not be helpful for us just to throw this term out there, the blood of the covenant, unless we explain the covenants. Now, a covenant uh, basically defined is an agreement between two people. There are two types of covenants. Two types of covenants. A bilateral covenant and a unilateral covenant. So we have bilateral and unilateral covenants. Bilateral covenants were made between two people. A unilateral covenant is an agreement made between God and man. Bilateral covenants, the terms are set and agreed upon by both parties. You could imagine or, or figure it this way. A, a, a covenant is like a contract where both parties agreed to each party to fulfill their to fill their end of the bargain, if you would have it that way. Bilateral covenant, covenants are the terms set and agreed upon by both parties. A unilateral covenant, the terms are set by God alone. So when we talk about this covenant, when when the Lord speaks of the blood of His covenant. He's not speaking about a bilateral covenant. He's speaking about a unilateral covenant, a covenant upon which he himself, God alone, has set the terms on. When we use this terminology of covenant, you'll hear the term cutting of covenants because there is blood involved. Covenants were always cut under the penalty of death, which means this, that if the covenant was broken that someone would justly have to die as a consequence. 
So the first is called the Old Covenant, from which we name the first part of the Bible the Old Testament. That's the Latin term, which means uh, the Latin rendering of the word covenant. The second is called New Covenant, or the New Testament. So here, in verse 11, what we see, we see, call, we see the call by God to His people to recall. In other words, to remember, to consider, if you would have it, the eternal nature of this covenant that God Himself unilaterally, that God Himself had unilaterally cut and declared to his people. For notice the text is specific. This is the blood of my covenant. That's what the text says. This is the blood of my covenant with you. This is the terms of the agreement that I have made. The terms that I have set with you. It is his covenant. It is his testament. So, specifically referenced in view here is the covenant that God made with Abraham. It was the practice in Old Testament days when uh, bilateral covenants were made that two parties involved in making the covenant would cut in half certain animals and lay them on the ground separated and then the two individuals would hold hands and would walk between the pieces of the animals that had been split in two, that symbolizing, basically symbolizing, that if one person broke the covenant, that they, like the animals, would be killed. But what took place on the day that God made the covenant with Abraham was this, that when the animal had been cut in two, God caused a deep sleep to fall on Abraham, and what did God do? God himself walked between the pieces. He walked between the pieces. And this, this became a unilateral covenant between God and man. And the great importance of this work that God himself did is that in foreshadowing, God stated that only an eternal sacrifice would be sufficient to fulfill the magnificent greatness of this covenant. Amen. This is what Troy speak, preached about last week from the book of Hebrews. He was talking about a better sacrifice that's built on better promises with a perfect propitiation, one that would ne not need to be repeated year after year after year. So moving on, notice here in the second part of verse 11, what he says there. He said, I will set your prisoners free from the waterless pit. The waterless pit was a hole that was dug very deep and kings would have their prisoners thrown into them to keep them until judgment was to be pronounced on them. They, they were well aware of what was being spoken of here. Have you ever heard the term, you have dug yourself a hole? Well, in reality, we were born in a hole. We were born in a pit of sin which was inescapable. Bound by sin and unable to escape from this waterless pit, we wallowed in the mire, but thanks be unto God, Christ came to save. Amen. The King of kings, by the blood of His covenant, has redeemed us from the curse of the law, and He Himself, by making atonement for our sins, he has set us free. Amen. This is why the psalmist declared in Psalm 40, I waited patiently for the Lord. He inclined to me and he heard my cry. And the psalmist declares, He drew me up from the pit of destruction. Amen. He lifted me up out of the miry bog and he set my feet upon a rock, making my steps secure. For he put a new song in my mouth. He put a song of praise unto our God. Many will see and fear, and many will put their trust in the Lord. One of the old hymns says, Guilty, vile, and helpless we, spotless Lamb of God was he. Full atonement, how can it be? Hallelujah, what a 
our Savior. Lifted up was he to die. It is finished was his cry. Now in heaven he's exalted high. Hallelujah. What a Savior. When he comes, our glorious King, all his ransom home to bring. Then anew his song will sing. Hallelujah. What a Savior. Amen. So again, here in this text, we in this text of Scripture, we read these words concerning Christ from the book of Isaiah. If you turn to the book of Isaiah, chapter 61, Isaiah chapter 61 in verse 4, the Word of God states this, the prophet, 200 years before Zechariah's time, 700 years likely before the time of Christ, Isaiah prophesies and declares this, The Spirit of the Lord God is upon me because the Lord has anointed me to bring good news to the poor. He has sent me to bind up the brokenhearted, to proclaim liberty to the captives, and the opening of the prison to those who are bound, to proclaim the year of the Lord's favor and the day of vengeance of our God, to comfort all who mourn, to grant those who mourn in Zion to give them a beautiful headdress instead of ashes or beauty for ashes, to give them the oil of gladness instead of mourning, to give them the garment of praise instead of the garment of a faint spirit, why? That they may be called the oaks of righteousness, the planting of the Lord, why? So that He may be glorified. They shall build up the ancient ruins 200 years. Isaiah prophesied this some 200 years before Zechariah. And what was taking place? The ancient ruins were being built up. They shall raise up the former devastations. They shall repair the ruined cities, the devastations of many generations. Who was this speaking of? Jesus Christ. Verse 12. As we move to close here, we see here in verse 12, the call, return to your stronghold, and the phrase, prisoners of hope, that is used. The call here, the call here is to the wandering soul. The call then was to the wandering soul, and the call today from the gospel to you who may be the wandering soul today is this, for whatever reason you have strayed from the Lord, return to your stronghold. Amen. Run to Christ, Amen. who is himself our high tower. Amen. Jesus is the lighthouse, Amen. as the old song declares in Proverbs Chapter 18 in verse 10, the, the term stronghold is not, by the way, the term stronghold here in the text is not used in a negative sense. It's not used in a negative connotation. It's used in a positive sense. It's spoken of as a place of safety and a place of security. In Proverbs 18.10, the name of the Lord is a strong tower. The righteous run into it. And they are safe. Amen. That is good news today. And the prophet declares to God's people then, and we hear and read this message today, return to your stronghold. Return to your tower. And then he says this, you prisoners of hope. That seems like a backward statement. It seems like if you're going to hear the term prisoner, that hope is not connected to being a prisoner. And from time to time, from time to time, many of us, I myself included, many of us are plagued with the sickness of depression. Many of us battle with the darkness of melancholy. But church, know this. Unlike those who have no hope as Christian people, we have a great hope. We have hope that is not only for this life, but also for the life to come. The Apostle Paul spoke to the Thessalonian church. In 1 Thessalonians 4 and 13, he said, We do not want you to be ignorant, brethren, about those who have died already or about those who are asleep in the Lord, that you may not grieve as others who do not have hope. 
In 1 Corinthians 15, the Apostle Paul states this concerning the resurrection of Christ. If in Christ we have hope in this life only, we are of all people most miserable. Oh, friend, our hope is not just for this life, but it is for the life to come. Why is that? Because Christ was incarnate in the flesh, born of the virgin, came into this world, lived a sinless life, died the atoning death for our sins, raised from the dead on the third day, ascended to the Father, and just as He was raised in bodily form and fashion, we too, according to the Word of God, will one day be raised bodily with glorified bodies. Amen. It's a hope of eternal life that we have. So may today, our prayer is this, that we may consider ourselves as Christians, that we might consider ourselves prisoners of hope. Our hope, again, is not imagined. It is not a mythical hope. But our hope is in the true and the living God. Amen. Our hope is in the God who made the heavens and the earth. Our hope is in the God who sent His only begotten Son to die for our sins. Amen. Our hope is a firm foundation, as the psalmist declared, as we read to you earlier. It is a firm foundation that is grounded in truth. How it asked, what is truth? The Lord answered in another place, Thy word is truth. Amen. His word is our hope. And this term used in verse 12 literally reads, the literal rendering of the Hebrew in this text literally reads those who have hope. When it says, you prisoners of hope. Those who have hope. Thomas Adams has said so clearly of hope. And, and what a precious statement this is. Thomas Adams said, hope, her proper seed is upon the earth. Hope, her proper object is in heaven of a quick and a piercing eye that can see the glory of God. This is what hope does. Hope sees the mercy of Christ. Hope sees the society of saints and angels. Hope sees the joys of paradise through all the clouds and all the orbs. As Stephen saw heaven open and Jesus standing in the holy place, so hope sees Christ. Hope's eyes so fixed on the blessedness above that nothing in this world can remove it. Faith is her attorney general. Prayer is her solicitor. Patience is her physician. Charity is her deacon. Thankfulness is her treasurer. Her vice admiral is the promise of God, her anchor. Peace. Her head of state is an eternal glory and an eternal crown which is found upon the head of our Lord Jesus Christ. Amen. Lastly, in Titus chapter 2, verse 11 through 14, and I would leave you with this encouragement from the Word of God. The Apostle Paul declares, For the grace of God has appeared. Brothers and sisters today, Christ has come. The grace of God has appeared, bringing salvation for all people, training us to renounce ungodliness and worldly passions and to live self-controlled, upright, and godly lives in this present age, waiting for our blessed hope, which is the appearing of the glory of our great God and Savior Jesus Christ, who himself, who gave himself for us, the scripture says, to redeem us from all lawlessness and to purify to himself, for himself, a people, a people for his own possession, who are zealous for good works. Stand with us this morning, if you would, please.